Hello and welcome along to the latest episode of the Manchester is Red podcast from the Manchester Evening News. I'm today's host, George Smith, and I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by my colleague and Chief United writer, Samuel Luckhurst, this Wednesday morning. Samuel, how are you? Not bad, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Samuel. Good to hear all is well at your end too. Well, after a busy, eventful Easter period for Manchester United, they've got a free midweek this week, which is a rarity after a Pretty chaotic Easter period with three games in a week, but uh, that didn't stop the news coming for United with this uh, this big announcement coming on Tuesday. Yesterday, as we record this off the pitch, with John Murta leaving Old Trafford, his position of football director has come to an end. He uh, His resignation was accepted last week, and it means Sir Jim Ratcliffe is continuing to shake things up at the top of the football club. Samuel, in truth, this is a, a decision that's been fairly obvious to most. It was going to happen at some point. You reported as far back as November that it was likely. And here we are now and John Murta's time at Old Trafford is officially over. Yes, it's it's not a surprise. Uh, he's He's been quite prominent, very visible still in, in recent months. But as soon as it was clear that Ineos were going to be coming in at United, and that was what, October time, and... I think they were getting their ducks lined up quite early on in that there were going to be changes to the structure. There was going to be a restructure and there aren't too many signs left, if you like, from the way the Ed Woodward era or, or era. And, uh, and, and John Murta is, is one of, one of those. And I, I think just by virtue of association with Woodward and that, that particular period in United's recent history, his his position was was untenable, which was is a little bit unfair on him. But when new people come in and any organisation, there tend to be changes and there tends to be upheaval uh, sooner or later. I remember asking some people at United uh, back in January or February, I can't remember which month, about it was around that time that Brailsford was coming in quite a lot and was quite visible early on. And they said there, there hasn't been any upheaval whatsoever. It's just been business as usual. And I think that tends to be the case. But at one point or another, eventually, some point down the line, there do tend to be quite, um, you know, quite substantial changes. In the case of Richard Arnold, he he jumped before he was pushed. There was always going to be a new chief executive coming in. Uh, John Murta, it, it, I think, I don't think many people really looked at his role and thought, yeah, Ineos will continue with him just because he he has, he had been at Manchester United for a long time. I think he started in December 2013. He'd done a number of roles before he was appointed the football director in March 2021. And recruitment is still one of the biggest problems at Manchester United. Murta was billed as a fixer by Ed Woodward, but there's a lot that's still broken at United. And that's not Murta's, that's not entirely Murta's fault by any stretch. And if you were to assess his his tenure as, as football director, I would, I would con- and I've done a piece on it this morning that, that touches upon it. He, he absolutely got it right. In a point in Eric Ten Hag over Mauricio Pochettino, you look at Pochettino over the past five years. I think he's a manager, a coach who's been in gradual decline, really, and that wasn't a, an obvious decision to make at the time. I, I, I've said it time and again that I was of the opinion that, that it should be Pochettino to come in and and as as the permanent successor to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Murta went with Ten Hag. And despite the way this season has gone, he made the right decision there. He put a lot of legwork in on the Casemiro deal, about three months worth, to convince him that United was a challenge worth accepting. Casemiro was probably their most influential player last season. Unfortunately for Murta, unfortunately for Ten Hag, it's this second season, the second full season um, in, in, in the case of, of Ten Hag that is is current and it's still ongoing. And, and that's what... Murta is probably likely to be remembered for more than some some good decisions along the way. I mean, he I think he his his intention in bringing Ralph Rangnick in uh, to kind of be this objective troubleshooter was was perfectly sound and, and and refreshing because United had too compliant a culture under Woodward, but Ralph Rangnick should have been in the director's box. He shouldn't have been in the dugout. And going back to that appointment in March 2021, the, the interesting thing at the time was that we, if you were to go back a little bit further, even five years to when Solskjaer was upgraded from caretaker to permanent manager, the main story around it was that United were close to appointing a, a technical director 
as they were billed at the time. And, and Edward Wood told us this as well. This was March 2019. Now, that appointment didn't happen until two years later. And when it did happen, it was a technical director and a football director um, being appointed. And those two people were John Murta and Darren Fletcher, two, two men who were right on United's doorstep. So the question was, why did it take two years to look to internal candidates? And, and Murta really, he, he was... He wasn't an unobvious candidate um, because he'd been at the club for a long time and he had dealt with the recruitment side of things. And he was, for example, he was there when he was he picked up Alexis Sanchez from the airport. He drove Alex Tellers into Carrington back in the days when you had to, you know, you had social distancing and there were all these protocols to adhere by. Uh, he introduced himself as the, the director of football when he recruited for the women's team in 2018. So he was kind of warming up for it. But from what I was told, it wasn't a role that he actually wanted. He didn't see himself as a director of football, yet United offered it to him. And if you're offered that role, it would take a very brave man to say no to it because it is the opportunity of a lifetime. And it was the, the opportunity to be the inaugural football director at United, this role that they'd never had before and they'd taken far too long to, to install. But here we are three years later, he's tendered his resignation. Um, he was on borrowed time for a number of months. I think everybody could see that. As you said, I, I did the story back in November and he, he, he was a bit of a, he was a bit of a victim of, of the street strategic review in a way and that had the strategic review not happened, United are probably carrying on regardless with him. There, there doubtless would have been scrutiny over his role every now and then, but he, I thought during the whole, this period under Ten Hag, when you look at United's recruitment, I don't think you can necessarily point the finger at John Murta because the, the signings are very much on, on Ten Hag's say so, and that's a structural problem at United, and that that that's a decision that should be taken above Murta. That's a decision that Richard Arnold should have uh, made and said, and, and if anything, tried to empower Murta more to say no to Ten Hag and. That if you go back to Ten Hag's first summer transfer window, it ended well, but it ended well that they went about it in the wrong way. The, the, the Casemiro signing, the, the Anthony signing, they overspent on both of them, and they were both appeasement signings after two really, really dire results against Brighton and Brentford. There was a, a panicky element about them, and that, that was something they couldn't panic. The season went quite well, but again, you go back to the recent summer transfer window, there were deadline day signings. Um, they they yielded Ten Hag, who really wanted Sofian Amrabat, and Sofian Amrabat is barely playing for United. It was a it was a bit of a surprise when he came on at the weekend against Liverpool. He's not played in the Premier League much at all this calendar year. That that might have been one of maybe two or three appearances he's made since since we entered twenty twenty four. So, but Murta could say no to Ten Hag because he he did over Hakim Ziyech, who coincidentally is 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 a teammate of Amrabat's at um, at international level. So, in terms of his his legacy at United, I don't think it's an entirely unfavourable one because he did make some good decisions during his relatively brief stint as football director. And I I dealt with him a number of times, and he was extremely amiable and approachable. And he did want to cultivate a more communicative culture with us dedicated correspondents because he saw the value in offering us um, tidbits, offering us insight and opening up the doors to us as well at times. I mean, uh, we've we've all had now a, a comprehensive tour of Carrington and that is mainly thanks to him. And before then, our perception of Carrington would have been this rundown, uh, you know, play, this this training facility that is not state of the art that really is you know unbecoming of Manchester United and look it, it certainly can be improved and the, there's a lot that needs to be done to get it back to where it was when it first opened its doors in 2000 but it is better inside than we all thought and allowing us that access which you know is, is obviously a privilege of this job and being able to be there in the canteen, see what the gym's like, see what the pool's like. We didn't get in the pool, I should I should uh, add, we didn't get in the jacuzzi or anything like that. <laughs> but having a look around, 
it's it's beneficial for Manchester United because they're, they're cultivating a um, they're fostering a, a, a good relationship with with journalists that hasn't always been as good as it should be, and it's it's, it's beyond beneficial for us. It's brilliant for us because we can write until our hearts content about it, and it's it's pretty fascinating as well to inform readers of what it is actually like behind those those closed doors. So he he did a lot of good work beyond the. I mean, you, you say the words football director and people just associate it with recruitment and quite rightly so. And that has been far from plain sailing and th- there have been mistakes along the way there. And look, with, with some of the players that they signed the summer, maybe they'll turn out to be brilliant United players, maybe they won't be. But the majority of those players, they were signed on Ten Hag say so. And that was a structural problem. Um, the whole, you know, the, the issue of saying to... Um, to a manager you can pick and choose when in this day and age it's it's a director of football who's doing the majority of the picking and choosing and they've got their ducks lined up right from the get-go and that's not always been the case at United but there was definitely a shift with Murta after I did that story in November and others did stories about um, you know I wrote about Ashworth as well of course towards the end of last year and others did as well normally if you encountered him at Old Trafford or Carrington or somewhere or other, he would he would do as much to catch your eye as you'd do to catch his eye, just to have a quick chat and say hello and you know, shoot the breeze. And at Newport County after the FA Cup game, he was in conversation with Dave Brailsford. We were coming from the opposite, uh, coming in the opposite direction. And I thought well, this is maybe a decent opportunity to have a, a relatively private, informal um you know, uh, introduction to, to to Brailsford, and Brailsford, of course, of course, has been burned by the press way more than Murta has in the past. But Murta just looked straight ahead and kind of, you know, rather not ex- maybe expertly blanked us. I'm not too sure what the right phrase would be necessarily. And then he, he you know, he, he didn't, he chose not to acknowledge us at the Munich Memorial event at Old Trafford. And on Sunday, he was just by the tunnel as we were approaching the mix zone. And when he saw some journalists approaching the mix zone who he recognised, that was his cue to go into the tunnel. And if you access the mix zone, you go up a gangway next to it. So um, by the end of it, I, I don't I, I don't harbour a grudge whatsoever um, against him for that. It's, it's It can't be pleasant when you're reading stories that are, um, you know, a chart in your, your your possible departure or your probable departure in this case from the club. It's It's not going to be pleasant, but that's an occupational hazard of working for Manchester United. Yeah, absolutely. And you've raised some very valid points there and you've given me insight that I wasn't aware of with how open he'd been with you and colleagues in the past in giving you insight into things behind the scenes because people obviously don't work in this industry. Football clubs can be pretty secretive when it comes to things and be very, very tight on what they are willing to leak or whatever like that. But would you say, Samuel, overall, John Murta, not just looking at his role as football director his whole time at Old Trafford, would you say he produced more positives than negatives? Because that's certainly the feeling I was getting from what information you were sharing there. I, I would overall. I mean, to, to be at a club for, for more than just over 10, just over 10 years is... Um, it, it is an achievement in itself, especially at that level. I'm, I'm sure some people will... Yeah, that they'll dispute that, and look, there's no doubt that this compliant culture that Woodward cultivated it, it did benefit Murta. He was never going to be someone to to rock the boat, and it was telling that two weeks after he and Darren Fletcher got their roles in March 2021, Nicky Butt left the club because Butt was appointed the head of academy in 2016 which was following on a, a period where the academy was in a state of flux and, and Murta and John Alexander, then the club secretary at the time, uh, not not a particularly popular man either at the club, it must be said. He was, um, I think he's the uncle of Trent Alexander-Arnold and, and he is a Liverpool fan, so I think a few had his card marked from the start. But they were jointly running the academy for most of 2015 and Nicky Butt took over from that. And then in the summer of 2019, Nick Cox became the academy head and I think Nicky Butt took on the role of head of player development. I think it might have been um, just overseeing players moving from the, the academy, going into men's football, hopefully in many players' case, into uh, the United first team. But Butt clearly was looking for a more senior role and 
it wasn't a surprise when United announced that he left two weeks after Murta left because Bart didn't really he didn't really care for uh, Murta from what I was told. There was a shouting match one time at Carrington uh, where Bart reputedly brought up uh, Murta's history on on Merseyside because he attended John uh, Liverpool John Moore's University and he also worked for Everton. And if you speak to him, there's there was a point where I couldn't work out whether he was actually born in Manchester or Liverpool because I think his accent has got a slight Scouse twang. I don't know if there were too many um, interviews of him online where where people can you know, go on YouTube and listen to it for themselves. But Nicky Butt, if, if anyone saw him and if anyone knows his nature and haven't interviewed him and, and watched him as a player as well, you know his character and he's going to be someone who uh, will rock the boat. And that's why he lasted about 18 months in the um, player development role. And of course, he's now the chief executive at, at Salford City. Whereas Murta, he did he did keep his powder dry. I think he played the politics pretty well. But when you, when you oversee a lot of work at the academy level, and I remember when I was at the FA Youth Cup uh, win against Chelsea in December 2018, when Mason Greenwood scored a hat-trick and Chelsea had absolutely dominated the Youth Cup for four or five years. And it was seen as a shock that Man United had knocked them out at the first round because United hadn't won the Youth Cup since the class of 2011 of Pogba, Morrison and, and Lingard. And here was this uplifting night where they beat Chelsea 4-3, Greenwood scored a hat-trick and, and Murta was absolutely pleased as punch. And he was one of those people that when you encounter them, you, you thought having dealt with him and met him and spoken to him a number of times, you thought if 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 everyone at Manchester United had that enthusiasm for Manchester United doing well, they'd be in a much better place than they are at the moment because he did, he absolutely cared deeply about the club at every single level. He recruited the players for the women's team, as I said earlier. And, and that was part of the reason why Ed Woodward made him the football director because he saw him as a fixer because he'd worked at academy level. He'd, he'd overseen um, the, the, the you know, the, the development um, of, of the women's team. He'd, he'd dealt a lot with first team matters as well. When it was Jose Mourinho's first day at Carrington in May 2016, Murta was there at reception to greet him. And I think his role at the time was head of football development, which he'd quietly been assigned and was, um, was, was revealed by Woodward on one of the conference calls earlier that year. So he was involved with a hell of a lot. And he, he, he was pushing for improvement. Uh, there were no two ways about it. He wasn't just someone who sat around and was happy just to exist at Manchester United. He wanted to justify his existence and he did want to, you know, get them moving in different directions. I mean, even at academy level, he was very much uh, backing you know, the decision to be more decisive in getting, um, in selling academy players who just weren't going to get any um who would who were never going to have that that pathway to the first team at United? Um, he was heavily involved in academy recruit, recruitment as well. And you go back to that final summer before the Brexit regulations kicked in that have prevented clubs and continue to prevent clubs from being able to sign overseas youngsters under the age of eighteen. They got Garnacho, they got Willie Cambuala, Alvaro Fernandez, and Mark Gerardo. So far, that's looking two out of four successes which is pretty good going still I mean it's, it's better going than the first team um, so I, I don't think he as I said I don't think he's his time should be remembered as um, as, as, as an unsuccessful period because he was he was a bit of a jack of all trades until he uh, got that football director role in March 2021 and six months into that that put into the role of course United signed Cristiano Ronaldo and you've got Ed Woodward trying to claim credit for Manchester United re-signing Cristiano Ronaldo and Woodward was telling us two years earlier around October 2019 time that he had nothing to do with recruitment and here he is trying to claim credit for this coup but and, and let's face it that coup was achieved through Sir Alex Ferguson's intervention and some peer pressure from some of Ronaldo's uh, former players so for, for Mer from Murta's perspective um it was it was probably just as well that he was a, a bystander amid that smash and grab, um, and and beyond other uh, be, beyond the signings and, and and recruitment, 
he was a big believer of data science and he wanted he brought Dominic Jordan in who's I think is the head of data science at at the club as well and he's I think there will be a lot of people at United who will be sorry to see him go um yeah, from a professional and a personal perspective, um, it, it, I am sorry to see him go. Uh, we, contrary to what some people may think, it, I don't think any of us relish writing stories um, about a pl- someone leaving a club when we actually we actually like them and we've had we've had good interactions with them, and that was certainly the case with with John Murta. Absolutely, and and moving forward, obviously, this highlights that Sir Jim Ratcliffe is continuing to shake things up and make these alterations. Samuel, you've done a story this morning where Matt Hargreaves is going to see oversee recruitment now, certainly on an interim basis, with obviously United still waiting on Dan Ashworth to come in and, and Jason Wilcox as well. So it really is clear that Sir Jim Ratcliffe wants to shake things up. He's moving the club in the right direction. And as, as you've headlined your piece this morning, United are making these changes that are potentially five years too late, which shows positive steps are being taken under the new regime very, very quickly. Yes, and it's it was an open goal for them and they are they are taking it, which is encouraging for United. I think all the all the moves they've made so far, Ineos, since since they came in as since the Jim, since the Jim Ratcliffe became the co-owner, have been very positive. Uh, obviously Barada, you, you're getting someone from one probably the best run elite football club in the world. I know that the Premier League may have something to say about that with the 115 charges and that that is certainly something that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. But beyond the potential or alleged book cooking that's gone on at Manchester City, at every level of their infrastructure, they are best in class and, and have been for quite some time. Dan Ashworth has got a really good reputation from the work he's done with the FA, with Brighton with Newcastle, um, also going back as far um, to his time at, at West Brom. I know the Sandro Tonali uh, signing is is going to be something that's held against him and, and I think in the eyes of many Newcastle fans that will probably define his legacy at the club. It's very, very difficult to, when you're doing due diligence on a player to unearth a player's um, gambling addicts or, or any form of addiction, especially when the player is doing their utmost to conceal that addiction, uh, I think you just have to kind of dismiss that as an aberration. Jason Wilcox, it'll be interesting to see what his specific remit is. I certainly think that his experience as academy director at Manchester City is potentially more, could be potentially more, um, you know, it more important from a United perspective in that City have done phenomenally well obtaining uh, borderline extravagant fees for academy players who have never ever got close to playing for the first team. James Trafford being a great example in the summer. United have not used their academy as a cash cow and that applies to a number of players in recent times. James Garner, I think they could have got a higher fee for him after been after a superb season on loan at Nottingham Forest when they got promotion to the championship. Ted and Mengi was effectively given away for a meal deal to Luton in the summer. Now he's a Premier League regular and uh, an England under-21 international. His valuation, ballpark figure, is probably £10 million now. And I know he had some really unfortunate injury issues at United and in the end it was, you know, they decided to cut their losses, but they, they really did give him away and they Hopefully, for their sake, there's quite a hefty sell-on clause if he does move on from Luton, because I think there's every chance they could get a good, good fee for him should they go down and he moves on in the summer. We'll wait and see. Even more of a legacy player, as far as the academy is concerned, Jesse Lingard in 2021, he was brilliant on loan at West Ham. West Ham set aside money to sign, effectively to sign him. It was clear that he should be sold because he'd entered the last year of his contract. Then you've got an indecisive manager who can't make his mind up whether he should stay or go. I mean, that is a decision that Murta should have taken out of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's hand and said, no, look, we're getting £30, £35 million for this player. He's been brilliant. We've got to strike while the iron's hot. We've got to sell him. It makes complete sense. So that's going to be a challenge for whoever is... Yeah, I mean, Nick Cox has done... I think tremendous work as the academy head at United since he came in in the summer of 2019, and there are so many, you know, so many highs over that 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 period. But 
the failure to obtain really good fees for some really good players in the case of those three just named there is still is still a black mark against them and that's something that they've really got to tap into Wilcox's knowledge of because I'd be looking at that more as his as his specialty rather than what he's done at Southampton he's only been at Southampton for nine months as the director of football and of course they've made a very good managerial appointment in Russell Martin they'll doubtless be in the playoffs I think Automatic promotion is probably beyond them now, especially after that dramatic defeat to Ipswich last week. And yeah, looking at his body of work at football administrative level, you're looking more at what he's done um, at the academy side at City rather than uh, what he's done at Southampton so far. But if you'll become the technical director of Manchester United, I would it would indicate that your your remit is going to extend well beyond the academy. Absolutely. And that does conclude part one of this episode of the Manchester is Red podcast. Do rejoin us in part two. We're going to have a little bit more conversation on matters off the pitch and where Sir Jim Ratcliffe might lead United this summer. Welcome back to part two of the Manchester is Red podcast with myself, George Smith and Samuel Luckhurst. Samuel, you discussed in part one about Dan Ashworth being a name that you've been writing about for several months now. He is the man that United wants. So Jim Ratcliffe has openly admitted that. And United are obviously in the position now where they're having to play a waiting game to be able to get hold of him. He's still on gardening leave from Newcastle United. There's been, been no real progress with the regional agreement for Newcastle to, to buy his contract out. United ultimately, though, they're probably making the right decision in waiting for him. They've set their target. Ineos have made it crystal clear they want him. They don't want anybody else. I think it's a positive step, even if it means waiting, that United have clearly got their prime target in position. It's going to be him. We'll wait however long it takes, but it's going to be worth it. I think that's the the general perception, the way United are looking at it, isn't it? I I would assume so. And in the case of Matt Hargreaves, where he's now, as as I said, he's overseeing recruitment plans. He was heavily involved last summer. He's he's been the de de facto replacement for Matt Judge, who was the director of football negotiations, I believe it was. He left in 2022, unsurprisingly, shortly after Woodward. You had that, you know, the, the... University of Bristol uh, alumni is there. Uh, Woodward, Judge, Richard Arnold, they're they're all gone now. Um, that that era, that culture is is pretty much ended, which is is for the better. I mean, again, dealt with some of them um, on on a number of occasions, and they were they they could be really good to deal with. And journalistically, uh, that's that's what you want. You want to be able to have insight and have um, cordial uh, working relationships. But when you look at when you assess their time at United, was it a success or a failure? It was an undeniable failure. So they're having to move on from there. And when you've got a new co-owner coming in, uh, who's in charge of football operations, you you really have got to change um, ch- change the makeup of of the structure. And there is, of course, a, a restructure that's that's underway now. In, in fairness to Hargreaves, he's. I mean, I wrote back in. I think it was September time that the the early um, the early word was that people were quite impressed with him and that um, he was trying to change the culture at United as well and they absolutely need that and I mean in terms of changing the culture in in, in the transfer market they do need to become more principled now and really if if they don't qualify for the Champions League this summer I I, I do see it as an opportunity for them to really set a new standard in terms of the transfer market because yesteryear if they didn't qualify for the Champions League it was always their most extravagant spending in the transfer window 2014 2016 and 2019 they in each of those summers they spent I think it was around between 140 to 152 million pounds I think in the 2014 summer it went just beyond that with the Radamel Falcao loan deal. And then, of course, their record summer of spending was in 2022, which, again, was after the failure to qualify for the Champions League. They can't be as extravagant now because of the profitability and sustainability rules, but also they can't they can't be allowed... They, they can't be spending €100 million Euros on a winger that they wanted all, all summer, pretty much, on deadline day. It, 
they they absolutely cannot do that for very obvious reasons and it will be very interesting to see how the the transfer market plays out for them but until maybe three years ago city were although they spent a hell of a lot of money of course they were pretty principled in terms of never spending more than 60 or 65 million pounds on a player i think the exception was jack grealish who of course cost 100 million pounds and when you look at their two uh, that their two strikers erling Haaland and julian alvarez i don't think they spent in, in terms of transfer fees that they'd have come in at under 70 million pounds i think united spent more overall uh, or have committed to spending more on rasmus hoyland so however way you look at it i mean in terms of the audit that dave brailsford will have done it's it's not difficult to pinpoint all these uh, errors along the way whether they've turned out to be successes or whether they've turned out to be failures but I really hope United say that they don't get into these negotiations where they are overspending on players because you have got to change the culture and they have to see this as an opportunity to do so. There are new people running the show. Um, there could be a new manager in charge as well for the summer. And I think a lot of managers, they they will be fully aware of the, the, the financial realities now in the because teams are getting deducted points and there have been three separate um, press releases from the Premier League this season on teams being deducted points for breaching financial regulations. Clubs are very careful of it. United have been very mindful of financial fair play for a fair old while now, um, which accounted for a number of uh, players leaving in in the January transfer window with their wages uh, being covered um, in in full or you know a large a large portion of by the clubs who are bringing them in on loan and of course if they're not in the Champions League next season that does have a significant bearing on what they can do in the transfer market I, I remember in 2017 doing a story that. Jose Mourinho had actually compiled two separate transfer lists depending on whether United qualified for the Champions League or not because their season of course came down to the Europa League final and it hinged on the season being a success hinged on that that game fortunately for United they won it they qualified for the Champions League the season was a success and they were able to flex their muscles um, in, in the transfer market more than they would have been had they lost that that final to Ajax in, in Stockholm the way it's shaping up at the moment, it would be a, a, a minor miracle if they're in the Champions League next season, given the state of play in the Premier League. But again, although that will have dire consequences for the finances, I'm sure, see it as an opportunity. See it as an opportunity to you know, have a clean slate, to establish this new culture in the transfer market, to have your ducks lined up for players that you want to get out this summer. And if you can't get them out this summer, you know they're going next summer. You look to next summer, if 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 Donny van der Beek is somehow still at Manchester United beyond the closure of the summer transfer window, he is out of contract next year, he is going. So the, the countdown is already on until he leaves United. It's just a case of when. But there are other players there who are on the same length of contract who are sellable assets. I mean, if if they're not getting a decent fee for Facundo Palistri in the summer, there will be something wrong because he's playing quite a lot in Spain. He's got a very, very good profile. Uh, he's a starter for Uruguay. You should be getting, they should be making a profit on him. However peripheral he has been for Manchester United since he came in uh, from Peñarol in, in, Oct in October 2020, he has done pretty well career-wise overall, playing at a World Cup. I think he started in two of Uruguay's three games. So as, as unsuccessful as this season may turn out to be, They've, they've. I think looking on the Ineos compass, there's that, there's that, um, the words they don't like, and can't is one of them, and I, I completely agree with that. They, they, they shouldn't be looking at these players and thinking, well, we're saddled with them, we can't sell them. They can sell them, and yes, Dan Ashworth won't be in there, and yes, there'll be some upheaval as well, and if next season doesn't turn out particularly positively, Ineos can say, well, look, we didn't have Dan Ashworth in the summer. We we're restructuring. We didn't qualify for the Champions League. So that obviously wreaked havoc with the plans as well. So I don't think it's a I don't think it's that di that invidious a position for them to be in, uh, compared to, to previous summers United have had, where you just know how it's 
you kind of know how it's going to play out before it's even started. I think they've got to see this summer as a as a pretty good opportunity to 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 really establish a, a new Manchester United in 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 every sense possible. But of course, there's still one more big decision to be made, and that is on the manager. And of course, whatever the restructure is, the manager is still going to have a big bearing on recruitment. Yeah, definitely. There's no doubt about that at all. But I think certainly from from our point of view in the in the job that we do, I think there's certainly an element of intrigue ahead of this summer. Whatever happens in the next four or five weeks with the FA Cup semi final, United's remaining seven Premier League games, it's certainly an exciting time. I feel to be covering the club because there is so much intrigue about what might happen in the summer, what could happen next season. But ultimately. As you said quite rightly, Samuel, it is an opportunity this this summer, whether United are in the Champions League or not, to wipe that slate clean, whoever the manager is, and, and build something fresh. Yes, and look, I think Ratcliffe has talked a very good game so far, and it's now up to them to, to play a good game on the pitch and in the boardroom and in the marketplace and do their utmost to have as as good a United squad as possible next season and as I wrote the other day they can clear the decks to an extent in that there are seven players of yeah, various profile who are senior players that they can just get rid of because they're coming to the end of their contracts and um, they can uh, they can send Sofia and Amrabat back to Fiorentina because they're, they're certainly not going to be taking up the option to buy him but then it is undermined by the lone players coming back and um, with, with a couple of them, Sancho and Greenwood, there is there is considerable baggage there as well because I think a lot of United fans will not want Sancho to ever play for the club again after he accused the manager of lying, irrespective of who the manager is next season. And a lot of United fans will not want Mason Greenwood to play for the club ever again. Um, fan power, force them into that climb down in the summer, into that U-turn. The, the only reason Mason Greenwood has not played for Manchester United this season and is on loan at Hetafe is because of supporters. And there are a lot of supporters, I'm sure, who would want to see him play for the club again. But ultimately, because of the, the reaction to the plan um, to reintegrate him into the squad, that is why he is at, at Hetafe, why he's playing in Spain. And Jim, Jim Ratcliffe has said there will be a fresh decision on that. But he also said, he, he posed the question, would the fans be comfortable, sincerely comfortable with him playing for Manchester United again? I don't think within a year's time they would be comfortable with Mason Greenwood playing for Manchester United again. A lot of them, maybe the majority of them, wouldn't be comfortable with him. There are always going to be some that will want him to play again. But I think people who are, who are trying to speak on behalf of Manchester United fans saying that the fans want him back in uh, they need to do their research because it was fan power that ensured he is not in the squad this season, that ensured that he is not on the back of the programmes on the squad list. So those two decisions, they have really got to, they've got to decisively sort out um, in, in June and I think they should have made those decisions by now already but you cannot have a scenario of United coming back in for pre-season training and Jane Sancho being at the barriers and behind him, Mason Greenwood is is waiting in his car. They've got to be very, very quick in making those calls. And with other players who have resale value and their options won't be taken up to sign them, I mean, I don't think Hannibal Mejbri is going to be signed permanently by Sevilla the way it's going for him. He's only made one La Liga start. Um, Alvaro Fernandez has been unused the last few games and that that was only going to become a that's only going to become a permanent deal if he plays a num certain number of games. So that's already a bit of a telltale sign. But there is obviously resale value in those two players. There is resale value in Facundo Palistri as well. I suppose there is a little bit of resale value in Donny Van der Beek. It might be equivalent to the cost of um, again a, a meal deal. But you know he's he's someone who. Is is small fry really? Like you can keep him around the place. Don't don't send him on the preseason tour. But 
you've you've got to you've got to find a buyer for him. He's got to he's got to go. I mean, Mason Greenwood is out of contract next year as well, so the decision has to be made this summer. That you, there's not going to be a scenario where United have him hanging around the place until the January transfer window, and then they decide to to get him off the books. Um, it has to be this summer, and they they can't they can't get that wrong. They got it they got it right eventually after going about it in the wrong way last summer, and. I understand why Ratcliffe is saying we need to make a fresh decision because it's new decision makers who who are who are calling the shots. But really, do Ineos want or need the baggage or the outcry of Mason Greenwood potentially playing for Manchester United again? Everyone knows the answer. No, they don't. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a, a complex issue that Ineos are going to have to try and solve as quickly as possible, as you say, Samuel. And Donny van der Beek is another good point to make. And I actually wrote about him yesterday on, on Tuesday in the sense that United obviously have the, well, Eintracht Frankfurt have the option to turn that loan deal into a permanent one. It already looks highly unlikely with the limited number of games he's had for Frankfurt at this moment in time. The biggest challenge for United could be actually finding a buyer for him because he's he's regressed so much since he joined United from Ajax for nearly four years ago. This is going to represent a big challenge just to find a buyer for him, isn't it? Because they're not going to be queuing up around the block to take him off United's hands. No, and I, I've half joked about it that Ajax owe United one after getting all that money for Anthony. Um, it's, it's it's high time that United go back to them and say, look, could you take this chap off our hands, please? And I, I actually think that would suit Van der Beek in the, for, from a lifestyle perspective and a playing perspective in that he's he's not been in the Netherlands squad since he had to withdraw from the last Euros through injury. Didn't get a look in whatsoever under Louis van Gaal. Isn't getting a look in whatsoever under Ronald Koeman. He will not be at the Euros in the summer. So if he wants to revive his international career, Going back to the Netherlands, playing for the biggest club in the Netherlands would be logical, but Ajax have been in a real, real state of disarray pretty much since Ten Hag left, it feels like. And, OK, you know, it, it may not appeal, but he doesn't appeal to many players, uh, sorry, many clubs either. And there has to be a reality there that his, his stock is so low that he ha that going to the biggest club in the Eredivisie where he you know he had such a, a brilliant time previously does make infinite sense so if you're if you're Matt Hargreaves you should be getting on the blower to Ajax and and trying to sell them van der Beek um even if it is for a, a very you know a knockdown fee I think it was 35 million rising to 40 million when United did that deal in 2020 the, the loss would be considerable but They've they've got to get him out because he he's he's not going to play for United again. He's not good enough to play for United, and so that's just an example of how how proactive they have to be and how proactive they can be in offloading uh, a number of players. I think the I think it's uh, certain players' futures are a lot clearer. Having done that piece a few weeks ago on how you're looking at about twenty one play senior players have, facing uncertainty entering the summer. You look at Harry Maguire and the, the, the character he's shown this season and the injuries to the other centre-halves and two of them being out of contract and breaking down recently and being referred to as old soldiers by Eric Ten Hag and that Victor Lindelof is out of contract next year. You look at Harry Maguire and you say, he, he's, he's probably, he's got to stay now by virtue of that. And also he's done, he's done well for himself this season, particularly given um, the starting point. But then next year, when uh, I think he, he his contract technically expires next year, but there's the plus one option. So if you trigger the plus one, and then you think, well, depend he's he's on trial next season. If he has a brilliant season, maybe give him a two year deal. Um, if not, then then, then cash in. But we, you know, things can change so quickly in football. As I said, um, in terms of in regards to that piece, when I did it at the time, I think he was injured. And of course, a player stop when they're injured. There is always bound to be a bit more uncertainty, especially if you're a player who um, the, the club accepted an offer for in the summer. And coming up to the Euros, he's, his record in big tournaments is excellent. He was probably the best centre half. Not probably, he was the best centre half at the Euros in 2021. If his resale value is high after the Euros, and if there's a, a brilliant, you know, a, an acceptable offer that comes in. 
can you say no to that? Um, I, I don't. I don't think that United United would be able to. So there are opportunities galore in that squad for getting good money, and that's without naming some of the high profile ones, Rashford and McTominay, two players who would represent a complete profit under the PSR regulations as well because they're academy players, and. You know, given the profile of those two players, United should be, if if they want to sell them, United should be looking to get more than £100 million for those two. Yeah, very intriguing indeed. It's going to be a, an interesting summer for sure. But that does bring a close to part two of the Manchester is Red podcast. We'll be back in part three to very briefly look at matters on the pitch and a big few games coming up for United. Welcome back to the third and final part of this episode of the Manchester is Red podcast. Samuel, we've had a long discussion about matters off the pitch. We're going to quickly touch on matters on the pitch and what's coming up for United. Obviously, yourself and Stephen recorded the podcast on Monday, looking back on the the Liverpool draw on on Sunday. And you two, of course, as everybody else has discussed, the chaotic style and United's way of playing at the minute. We all know what's happening there. But United ultimately now, we've obviously been hoping and willing them on to hopefully get into those Champions League places. It is looking increasingly unlikely now, 11 points behind both Spurs and Villa with just seven games left to go. United now looking in that rearview mirror opposed to in front of them because Newcastle and West Ham creeping up. And United ultimately, they're not even assured of Europa League football yet, perhaps even Europa Conference League. So United need a big finish here, but you, you look at their next three league games, either side of the FA Cup so far with Coventry City, Bournemouth away, and then back-to-back home games with Sheffield United and Burnley. It, it's got to be nine points, hasn't it? it? It really has to be. It has to be the aim. Unfortunately for them, they've only won one of their last six in the Premier League. And if you're an extremely optimistic United fan, you'd look at Bournemouth away with, with Villa playing against Arsenal, on Sunday and then United ending the month with two home games against the the two worst teams in the league and suddenly you, you think if, if they take nine points out of nine there maybe maybe there's an outside chance that they can still sneak in probably by, by finishing fifth but very few people have faith in this team to do that and that's even taken into account how how much Villa have been wobbling in in recent months? Probably going back to the the Boxing Day uh, uh, comeback that United had against them. Uh, I wasn't particularly impressed with Villa at all that evening. Uh, I think I've, I've been impressed with Villa under Unai Emery, but they are and, and Ollie Watkins touched upon it at the weekend how they str- they struggle with a big game mentality, and that's because they're they're not really accustomed they're not accustomed to big games because they've been. Um, they were only promoted back to the Premier League in 2019. They survived by the skin of their teeth in the first season. They they were planned through treacle uh, under Dean Smith and, and and Stephen Gerrard, and then they got Emery, and he he has elevated them to heights that they probably didn't anticipate they would um, they would reach this season. And the Champions League is within sight, but they are wobbling. Tottenham. <laughs> Everyone knows how often and, and how prone they are to bottling it, but there's a reason why they're they're fourth, um, and there's a reason why they're as far ahead of United as they are. Because United also, you, they they don't have the right mentality. Uh, that's been clear all season. The evidence this season would suggest they do not have it in them to finish fifth. And as far as Europa competition, as as you said, George, it's it is a question I still think as to where which Europa competition there will be in next season. And that rescheduled game against Newcastle at Old Trafford, I I, I think will probably be the penultimate their penultimate league fixture of the season. It'll probably be the final midweek of the season because the Premier League will absolutely want that for television. And they won't want it clashing with the Champions League and the European midweeks. So it's likely to be that final midweek of the season, as the Chelsea home game was for United last season, which was rearranged after they reached the FA Cup semi-finals. And that game, it could be a shootout to see who's in the Conference League and who's in the Europa League next season. That said, if United are in the FA Cup final, and if they win the FA Cup, I think that triggers Europa League competition. So it might go down to um, the, the, the date at Wembley, should they get past Coventry. 
Absolutely. And just looking at the data now, which is interesting, actually, and I wasn't aware it was quite so poor as this. United more than likely going to have to win every remaining game if they are going to stand any chance of achieving one of those two Champions League spots. But their longest winning run this season in the league is four games. Their longest unbeaten run in the league is only five games. It's going to be a big, tall order. And Samuel, you've quite rightly mentioned that the character and the mentality of this team, it's unlikely that it's got it in it to go and win seven Premier League games in a row, bearing in mind they've got to face Arsenal still. They've got to play Newcastle, as you say. And they've got an FA Cup semi-final sandwiched in it. It's going to take a hell of a lot and it is increasingly unlikely. And they're playing away to three teams who have won at Old Trafford this season, Bournemouth, uh, Palace and and Brighton. Bournemouth were excellent at Old Trafford in December. I was really impressed uh, by them. Their decision in the summer to sack Gary O'Neill, I don't think many people agreed with it, but Iriola's come in and is, is certainly overseeing excellent work. I, I thought Gary O'Neill was probably the manager of the season last season, given the job he did after they started the season with Scott Parker and they just seemed doomed uh, and, and bound for for the championship. To keep them up was was a magnificent effort and he's, he's doing a really good job at, at Wolves now as well. But I thought Bournemouth and Old Trafford in December were excellent, possibly the best opposition team at Old Trafford this season and I know United were really bad that day but seeing Bournemouth play the way they did and I think it was their second goal they scored it was so superbly worked everyone hitting their cues they've got some good players as we all know um, Dominic Solanke will not be at the Euros but he's he's having the season of his life to the point where people are looking at him thinking well <laughs> if in, in another lifetime he, he might have been you know back in the days when United could Go down the go down the ladder and and take the best player off um, th- those those clubs in the Premier League. They they'd be doing that with Bournemouth and Solanke um, as as they did with, for example, Luis Aha from Fulham in two thousand and four. It doesn't quite work out uh, like that anymore now. So that game this weekend, it's it's far from a foregone conclusion that United will win that. Uh, they eked out a one nil win there last season in May, um, having lost a couple of games before it. So I, look, if, if they win their final seven games, I think most people will be pretty shocked by that because I'm not surprised whatsoever when you, you, you trust out those stats there about the longest winning run and longest unbeaten run in the Premier League. It's, it's just not good enough for a team that wants to finish in the top four. Uh, and at the start of the season, most people had United down down to finish in the top four. Uh, I think Liverpool, Arsenal and City were givens. And Tottenham had only just appointed a new coach. Uh, Chelsea had just appointed a new coach and was still clearly quite dysfunctional. Um, nobody really saw Villa as being contenders. I think they were dark horses at best. So... To not finish in the top four, it will be a, a big failure. I, I, I still think, I said it on Monday, I do think the league season, it, it already feels like a bit of a write-off. And I think some of the fans feel that way as well. During the Liverpool game, they were singing about going to Wembley and the FA Cup. And that's that's what they've got to look forward to now. And they've got that day next week against Coventry. And hopefully they'll be back there next month uh, for another FA Cup final. Yeah, fingers crossed. It certainly applies plenty of pressure to that game with the the league position, as you say. But just lastly, Samuel, to wrap things up, it's come out in the last couple of days that there is apparently an extra loophole where United could get into the Champions League via finishing in sixth spot. But that would require West Ham to finish uh, finish fifth, bearing in mind they're 12 points behind Villa and Spurs at the minute and have to win the Europa League as well. Bearing in mind they've got to play Bayer Leverkusen this week. It's highly unlikely. So, we can probably extinguish that hope that United might have had. So it needs a hell of a lot to fall into place for that. You, one. You've, term, you've, you've told me something I didn't know there, but it's yeah, it's, 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 it's amusing nonetheless. Yeah, it would certainly need a lot to go United's favour. But ultimately, United yeah. shouldn't be relying on favours, should they, in this position. The amount of money that they've spent, the quality that they have. And of course, we've all done it to death about the style of play and the injuries and things like that. But ultimately, United, with the quality they've had, albeit not all at the same time this season because of the injuries, they should have had enough to be well within touching distance at the very least the top four at this stage of the season. Yes, it's, it's been a, they've they've gone backwards this season. There's there's no denying it. And that's why the manager's future is in the balance. And it's why the result of the weekend has uh, had some laudable characteristics. There was some resilience about them. 
but it wasn't a good result. It was a worse result for Liverpool, of course, given that they um, they could have gone top and they had 15 shots to none in the first half and they repeated mistakes that they made against United in the Cup game. But it's it, it wasn't like the draw that United had against Liverpool in February 2019, which you know, contributed heavily towards uh, Liverpool not winning the title that season. United were an up, on an upward curve at that point. They did have momentum. They were doing well under Solskjaer and there was a feel-good factor around the place. That's that's not the case um, and hasn't been the case for most most of the season, unfortunately. Uh, I think the killer was was that Fulham game. It was, on paper, that was their easiest game in February. They'd won all their games before that. And to have to have lost as as decent a team as Fulham are, but to have lost to a team that I mean their their away following didn't even sell all their tickets that day. You're at home having having won all their games in in the month. To to, to have performed that badly that that was the day that it was almost the defining moment of United's league season that they somehow lost that game. Um, they've had far more memorable defeats this season beyond that Fulham one. And and more chaotic defeats than than the Fulham one, but that was th- that was a setback that I don't I just don't see them recovering from as far as the league is concerned. Yeah, there's certainly been too many home defeats, certainly within that similar bracket, such as losing to Crystal Palace, Bournemouth, as you mentioned, were very very good on the day in December, but that Fulham defeat was particularly damaging. You're quite right. But that does bring an end to this episode of the Manchester Is Red podcast. A big thank you to Samuel for joining me today. As always, if you've enjoyed listening to this episode and you'd like to watch it as well, we are on YouTube, of course. Just search Manchester is Red and you could subscribe to the channel. We'll be back again later in the week on Friday to look ahead to Saturday's trip to Bournemouth. So do rejoin us then for that one. But until then, have a great week and we'll catch you again very, very soon.